This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by Betsy Bush, Marquette, Michigan, July 2006. Rutabaga Stories by Carl Sandburg. Part 1. Three stories about the finding of the zigzag railroad, the pigs with bibs on, the circus clown ovens, the village of liver and onions, the village of cream puffs. People. Gimme the axe. Please gimme. Ax me no questions. The ticket agent. Wing tip the spick. The four uncles. The rat in a blizzard. The four rusty rats. More people. Balloon pickers, baked clowns, polka dot pigs. How they broke away to go to the Rutabaga country. Gimme the Axe lived in a house where everything is the same as it always was. The chimney sits on top of the house and lets the smoke out, said Gimme the Axe. The doorknobs open the doors. The windows are always either open or shut. We are always either upstairs or downstairs in this house. Everything is the same as it always was. So he decided to let his children name themselves. The first words they speak as soon as they learn to make words shall be their names, he said. They shall name themselves. When the first boy came to the house of Gimme the Axe, he was named Please Gimme. When the first girl came, she was named Ax Me No Questions and both of the children had the shadows of valleys by night in their eyes, and the lights of early morning, when the sun is coming up, on their foreheads. And the hair on top of their heads was a dark wild grass, and they loved to turn the doorknobs, open the doors, and run out to have the wind comb their hair and touch their eyes, and put its six soft fingers on their foreheads. And then, because no more boys came and no more girls came, Gimme the Axe said to himself, my first boy is my last, and my last girl is my first, and they picked their names themselves. Please Gimme grew up, and his ears got longer. Ax Me No Questions grew up, and her ears got longer. And they kept on living in the house where everything is the same as it always was. They learned to say, just as their father said, The chimney sits on top of the house, and lets the smoke out. The doorknobs open the doors. The windows are always either open or shut. We are always either upstairs or downstairs. Everything is the same as it always was. After a while, they began asking each other in the cool of the evening, after they had eggs for breakfast in the morning, Who's who? How much? And what's the answer? It is too much to be too long anywhere, said the tough old man, Gimme the Axe. And please Gimme and ax me no questions, the tough son and the tough daughter of Gimme the Axe, answered their father, It is too much to be too long anywhere. So they sold everything they had, pigs, pastures, pepper pickers, pitchforks, everything except their rag bags and a few extras. When their neighbors saw them selling everything they had, the different neighbors said, They are going to Kansas, to Kokomo, to Canada, to Kankakee, to Kalamazoo, to Kamchatka, to the Chattahoochee. One little sniffer with his eyes half shut and a mitten on his nose laughed in his hat five ways and said, They are going to the moon, and when they get there they will find everything is the same as it always was. All the spot cash money he got for selling everything, pigs, pastures, pepper pickers, pitchforks, Gimme the axe put in a rag bag and slung on his back like a rag picker going home. Then he took Please Gimme, his oldest and youngest and only son, and Ax Me No Questions, his oldest and youngest and only daughter, and went to the railroad station. The ticket agent was sitting at the window selling railroad tickets the same as always. Do you wish a ticket to go away and come back? Or do you wish a ticket to go away and never come back? the ticket agent asked, wiping sleep out of his eyes. We wish a ticket to ride where the railroad tracks run off into the sky and never come back. Send us far as the railroad rails go, and then forty ways farther yet. 
was the reply of Gimme the Axe. "'So far? So early? So soon?' asked the ticket agent, wiping more sleep out of his eyes. "'Then I will give you a new ticket. It blew in. It is a long, slick, leather-slab ticket, with a blue spanch across it.' Gimme the Axe thanked the ticket agent once, thanked the ticket agent twice, and then, instead of thanking the ticket agent three times, he opened the rag-bag and took out all the spot-cash money he got for selling everything—pigs, pastures, pepper-pickers, pitchforks, and paid the spot-cash money to the ticket agent. Before he put it in his pocket, he looked once, twice, three times at the long yellow leather slab ticket with a blue spanch across it. Then, with Please Gimme and Ask Me No Questions, he got on the railroad train, showed the conductor his ticket, and they started to ride to where the railroad tracks run off into the blue sky, and then forty ways farther yet. The train ran on and on. It came to the place where the railroad tracks run off into the blue sky. And it ran on and on. Chick, chick, a chick, chick, a chick, chick, a chick. Sometimes the engineer hooted and tooted the whistle. Sometimes the fireman rang the bell. Sometimes the open and shut of the steam hog's nose choked and spit, fisty fust, fisty fust, fisty fust. But no matter what happened to the whistle and the bell and the steam hog, the train ran on and on to where the railroad tracks run off into the blue sky, and then it ran on and on more and more. Sometimes Gimme the Axe looked in his pocket, put his fingers in, and took out the long, slick, yellow leather slab ticket with a blue spanch across it. Not even the kings of Egypt, with all their climbing camels, and all their speedy-spotted lucky lizards, ever had a ride like this, he said to his children. Then something happened. They met another train running on the same track. One train was going one way, the other was going the other way. They met. They passed each other. What was it? What happened? the children asked their father. One train went over, the other train went under, he answered. This is the over and under country. Nobody gets out of the way of anybody else. They either go over or under. Next they came to the country of the balloon pickers. Hanging down from the sky, strung on strings so fine the eye could not see them at first, was the balloon crop of that summer. The sky was thick with balloons. Red, blue, yellow balloons, white, purple, and orange balloons, peach, watermelon, and potato balloons, rye loaf and wheat loaf balloons, link sausage and pork chop balloons. They floated and filled the sky. The balloon pickers were walking on high stilts, picking balloons. Each picker had his own stilts, long or short. For picking balloons near the ground, he had short stilts. If he wanted to pick far and high, he walked on a far and high pair of stilts. Baby pickers on baby stilts were picking baby balloons. When they fell off the stilts, the handful of balloons they were holding kept them in the air till they got their feet onto the stilts again. "'Who is that away up there in the sky, climbing like a bird in the morning?' "'Ask me no questions,' asked her father. "'He was singing too happy,' replied the father." The songs came out of his neck, and made him so light the balloons pulled him off his stilts. Will he ever come down again back to his own people? Yes, his heart will get heavy when his songs are all gone. Then he will drop down to his stilts again. The train was running on and on. The engineer hooted and tooted the whistle when he felt like it. The fireman rang the bell when he felt that way and sometimes the open and shut of the steam hog had to go fisty fust fisty fust next is the country where the circus clowns come from said gimme the axe to his son and daughter keep your eyes open they did keep their eyes open they saw cities with ovens long and short ovens fat and stubby ovens lean lank ovens all for baking either long or short clowns or fat and stubby, or lean and lank clowns. After each clown was baked in the oven, it was taken out into the sunshine and put up to stand like a big white doll with a red mouth, leaning against the fence. 
Two men came along to each baked clown, standing still like a doll. One man threw a bucket of white fire over it. The second man pumped a wind pump with a living red wind through the red mouth. The clown rubbed his eyes, opened his mouth, twisted his neck, wiggled his ears, wriggled his toes, jumped away from the fence, and began turning handsprings, cartwheels, somersaults, and flip flops in the sawdust ring near the fence. The next we come to is the Rutabaga country, where the big city is the village of liver and onions, said Gimme the Axe, looking again in his pocket to be sure he had the long, slick, yellow leather slab ticket with a blue spanch across it. The train ran on and on till it stopped running straight and began running in zigzags, like one letter Z put next to another Z and the next and the next. The tracks and the rails and the ties and the spikes under the train all stopped being straight and changed to zigzags like one letter Z and another letter Z put next after the other. It seems like we go half way and then back up, said Ask Me No Questions. Look out of the window and see if the pigs have bibs on, said Gimme the Axe. If the pigs are wearing bibs, then this is the rutabaga country. And they looked out of the zigzagging window of the zigzagging cars, and the first pigs they saw had bibs on. And the next pigs and the next pigs, they all had bibs on. The checker pigs had checker bibs on, the striped pigs had striped bibs on, and the polka dot pigs had polka dot bibs on. Who fixes it for the pigs to have bibs on? Please, Gimme asked his father. The mothers and fathers fix it. Answered Gimme the Axe. The checker pigs have checker fathers and mothers, the striped pigs have striped fathers and mothers, and the polka dot pigs have polka dot fathers and mothers. And the train went zigzagging on and on, running on the tracks and the rails and the spikes and the ties which were all zigzag like the letter Z and the letter Z. And after a while, the train zigzagged on into the village of liver and onions. Known as the biggest city in the big, big Rutabaga country. And so, if you are going to the Rutabaga country, you will know when you get there, because the railroad tracks change from straight to zigzag, the pigs have bibs on, and it is the fathers and mothers who fix it. And if you start to go to that country, remember first, you must sell everything you have pigs, pastures, pepper pickers, pitchforks. Put the spot cash money in a rag bag and go to the railroad station and ask the ticket agent for a long, slick yellow leather slab ticket with a blue spanch across it. And you mustn't be surprised if the ticket agent wipes sleep from his eyes and asks, So far, so early, so soon? How they bring back the village of cream puffs when the wind blows it away. A girl named Wingtip the Spick came to the village of Liver and Onions to visit her uncle and her uncle's uncle on her mother's side, and her uncle and her uncle's uncle on her father's side. It was the first time the four uncles had a chance to see their little relation, their niece. Each one of the four uncles was proud of the blue eyes of Wingtip the Spick. The two uncles on her mother's side took a long, deep look into her blue eyes and said, her eyes are so blue, such a clear light blue. They are the same as cornflowers with blue raindrops shining and dancing on silver leaves after a sun shower in any of the summer months. And the two uncles on her father's side, after taking a long, deep look into the eyes of Wingtip the Spick, said, Her eyes are so blue, such a clear light shining blue. They are the same as cornflowers with blue raindrops, shining and dancing on the silver leaves after a sun shower in any of the summer months. And though Wingtip the Spick didn't listen, and didn't hear what the uncle said about her blue eyes, she did say to herself when they were not listening, I know these are sweet uncles, and I am going to have a sweet time visiting my relations. The four uncles said to her, Will you let us ask you two questions? First the first question, and second the second question. I will let you ask me fifty questions this morning, fifty questions tomorrow morning, and fifty questions any morning. 
I like to listen to questions. They slip in one ear and slip out of the other. Then the uncles asked her the first question first. Where do you come from? And the second question second. Why do you have two freckles on your chin? Answering your first question first, said Wingtip the Spick, I come from the village of Cream Puffs, a little light village on the upland corn prairie. From a long ways off, it looks like a little hat you could wear on the end of your thumb to keep the rain off your thumb. Tell us more, said one uncle. Tell us much, said another uncle. Tell it without stopping, added another uncle. Interruptions, nix, nix, murmured the last of the uncles. It is a light little village on the upland corn prairie, many miles past the sunset in the west, went on Wingtip the Spick. It is light the same as a cream puff is light. It sits by itself on the big long prairie where the prairie goes up in a slope. There on the slope the winds play around the village. They sing it wind songs, summer wind songs in summer, winter wind songs in winter. And sometimes, like an accident, the wind gets rough. And when the wind gets rough, it picks up the little village of cream puffs and blows it away off in the sky, all by itself. Oh, said one uncle. Mmm, said the other three uncles. Now, the people in the village all understand the winds with their wind songs in summer and winter, and they understand the rough wind who comes sometimes and picks up the village and blows it away off high in the sky all by itself. If you go to the public square in the middle of the village, you will see a big round house. If you take the top off the round house, you will see a big spool with a long string winding up around the spool. Now, whenever the rough wind comes and picks up the village and blows it away off high in the sky, all by itself, then the string winds loose off the spool, because the village is fastened to the string. So the rough wind blows and blows, and the string on the spool winds looser and looser the farther the village goes blowing away off into the sky all by itself. Then at last, when the rough wind, so forgetful, so careless, has had all the fun it wants, then the people of the village all come together and begin to wind up the spool and bring back the village where it was before. Oh, said one uncle. Mmm, said the other three uncles. And sometimes, when you come to the village to see your little relation, your niece, who has four such sweet uncles, Maybe she will lead you through the middle of the city to the public square and show you the round house. They call it the round house of the big spool, and they are proud because it was thought up and is there to show when visitors come. And now will you answer the second question second? Why do you have two freckles on your chin? Interrupted the uncle who had said before, Interruptions, nix, nix. The freckles are put on answered Wingtip the Spick. When a girl goes away from the village of Cream Puffs, her mother puts on two freckles on the chin. Each freckle must be the same as a little burnt cream puff kept in the oven too long. After the two freckles, looking like two little burnt cream puffs, are put on her chin, they remind the girl every morning when she combs her hair and looks in the looking-glass. They remind her where she came from, and she mustn't stay away too long. Oh, said one uncle. Mmm, said the other three uncles. And they talked among each other afterward, the four uncles by themselves, saying, She was a gift. It is her eyes. They are so blue, such a clear light blue, the same as cornflowers with blue raindrops shining and dancing on silver leaves after a sun shower in any of the summer months. At the same time, Wingtip the Spick was saying to herself, I know for sure now these are sweet uncles, and I am going to have a sweet time visiting my relations. How the Five Rusty Rats Helped Find a New Village One day, while Wingtip the Spick was visiting her four uncles in the village of Liver and Onions, a blizzard came up. 
Snow filled the sky, and the wind blew and made a noise like heavy wagon axles grinding and crying. And on this day a gray rat came to the house of the four uncles, a rat with gray skin and gray hair, gray as the gray gravy on a beefsteak. The rat had a basket. In the basket was a catfish. And the rat said, Please let me have a little fire and a little salt, as I wish to make a little bowl of hot catfish soup to keep me warm through the blizzard. And the four uncles all said together, This is no time for rats to be around, and we would like to ask you where you got the catfish in the basket. Oh, 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 please, in the name of the five rusty rats, the five lucky rats of the village of Cream Puffs, please don't, was the exclamation of Wingtip the Spick. The uncles stopped. They looked long and deep into the eyes of Wingtip the Spick, and thought, as they had thought before, how her eyes were clear light blue, the same as cornflowers with blue raindrops shining on the silver leaves in a summer sun shower. And the four uncles opened the door and let the gray rat come in with the basket and the catfish. They showed the gray rat the way to the kitchen and the fire and the salt, and they watched the rat and kept him company while he fixed himself a catfish soup to keep him warm traveling through the blizzard with the sky full of snow. After they opened the front door and let the rat out and said good-bye, they turned to Wingtip the Spick and asked her to tell them about the five rusty rats of the village of Cream Puffs, where she lived with her father and her mother and her folks. When I was a little girl growing up, before I learned all I learned since I got older, my grandfather gave me a birthday present, because I was nine years old. I remember how he said to me, You will never be nine years old again after this birthday, so I give you this box for a birthday present. In the box was a pair of red slippers with a gold clock on each slipper. One of the clocks ran fast, the other clock ran slow, and he told me if I wished to be early anywhere, I should go by the clock that ran fast. And if I wished to be late anywhere, I should go by the clock that ran slow. And that same birthday, he took me down through the middle of the village of Cream Puffs to the public square near the roundhouse of the big spool. There he pointed his finger at the statue of the five rusty rats, the five lucky rats. And as near as I can remember his words, he said, Many years ago, long before the snowbirds began to wear funny little slip-on hats and funny little slip-on shoes, and away back long before the snowbirds learned how to slip off their slip-on hats and how to slip off their slip-on shoes, long ago in the faraway village of Liver and Onions, the people who ate cream puffs came together and met in the streets and picked up their baggage and put their belongings on their shoulders and marched out of the village of liver and onions saying we shall find a new place for the village and the name of it shall be the village of cream puffs they marched out on the prairie with their baggage and belongings in sacks on their shoulders and a blizzard came up snow filled the sky the wind blew and blew and made a noise like heavy wagon axles grinding and crying the snow came on the wind twisted all day and all night and all the next day. The wind changed black and twisted and spit icicles in their faces. They got lost in the blizzard. They expected to die and be buried in the snow for the wolves to come and eat them. Then the five lucky rats came, the five rusty rats, rust on their skin and hair, rust on their feet and noses, rust all over and especially, most especially of all, rust on their long, curved tails. They dug their noses down into the snow, and their long, curved tails stuck up far above the snow, where the people who were lost in the blizzard could take hold of the tails like handles. And so, while the wind and the snow blew, and the blizzard beat its icicles in their faces, they held on to the long, curved tails of the rusty rats, till they came to the place where the village of Cream Puffs now stands. It was the rusty rats who saved their lives, and showed them where to put their new village. That is why this statue now stands in the public square. 
this statue of the shapes of the five rusty rats, the five lucky rats, with their noses down in the snow, and their long curved tails lifted high out of the snow. That is the story as my grandfather told it to me, and he said it happened long ago, long before the snowbirds began to wear slip-on hats and slip-on shoes, long before they learned how to slip off the slip-on hats and to slip off the slip-on shoes. Oh, said one of the uncles. Mmm, said the other three uncles. And sometime, added Wingtip the Spick, when you go away from the village of Liver and Onions, and cross the Shampoo River, and ride many miles across the upland prairie, till you come to the village of Cream Puffs, you will find a girl there who loves four uncles very much. And if you ask her politely, she will show you the red slippers with gold clocks on them, one clock to be early by, the other to be late by. And if you are still more polite, she will take you through the middle of the town to the public square, and show you the statue of the five rusty lucky rats, with their long curved tails sticking up in the air like handles. And the tails are curved so long and so nice you will feel like going up and taking hold of them to see what will happen to you. End of part one.